So my name is Andy Wingo. I work for a company out of Spain called Egalia. We do a lot of consulting around WebKit. And as such, I've gotten into JavaScript Core a bit. And JavaScript Core is the, the JavaScript engine of, of the WebKit project itself. In fact, a, a bit on VA before uh, on JavaScript Core, but in, in reality, I'm a traveler in foreign lands here. It's my heart is from the scheme language. So it's, it's interesting coming into these uh, implementations from the outside and seeing you know, what's really going on. And the tag for this talk uh, had a bit of hubris associated with it, I think, um, claiming that JavaScript Core is as fast as V8 on its own benchmark. And as we'll see, that claim has a, a shape to it. And some of that shape is true. And some of that shape is uh, not quite true yet. Uh, but let's take a look uh, at the DFG, at the optimizing compiler of the JavaScript Core uh, engine. And see, you know, what is it that it actually does? Um, so it, as I mentioned, uh, the DFG is JavaScript Core's optimizing compiler. Uh, you know, the, the standard architecture of these JavaScript engines is you have something for dealing with cold code and something for dealing with hot code. And for JavaScript Core, we have the low-level interpreter for very cold code. There's an intermediate phase with what we call the baseline JIT, which is a, a JIT that doesn't do any global analysis or optimization. And then we have the DFG JIT, which uh, is able to take a bit more time, has a bit more information, and can take a bit more of a, a global view on your program. So this much is fairly well known, but I, I don't think it's very you know, well understood you know, what, what it is that this engine does with your code and how it works and you know, what its performance characteristics are. And so I would like to take a more empirical approach to it. I would like to you know, measure. Uh, the DFG JIT and see how it does on various representative test cases and see you know, when it does this. When, when does it kick in? What, what are its dynamic characteristics? Not simply you know, performance as a number, uh, which is great for the marketing folks, but performance as a, a shape and a distribution, which is uh, much more interesting from a perspective of understanding the, the software. I'd also take, like to take a look at the um, assembly code that is produced by this. So I, I promise it won't be all assembly, but I, th I think it's kind of interesting to see how your JavaScript is translated into what machine code um, when you run on a, a browser with JavaScript core. So as my tool in this regard, I'm going to use the, the V8 benchmarks, uh, V8 version 7 benchmarks. And these benchmarks are really geared towards optimizing compilers. Right? They, they don't test anything else in your system. They, they test your optimizing, the, the output of your optimizing compiler and, and also your garbage collector as well. And the reason you can know about these is they, they take quite a long time to run. Uh, and, and they take a, a long time to run because they take a full second uh, to warm up the code for each benchmark. And then they measure over another second um, how they take a, a number of iterations until you get up to a second of, of iterations of these benchmarks. And then they, they divide the time by the iterations, and you get a, uh, a time per iteration. And that, that time ends up going on the denominator of the result, so that you know, higher values on the V8 benchmark, as we all know, uh, actually correspond to higher performance. And so uh, uh, it's, it's very good for measuring you know, the best that your compiler can do, but it's, it's not so good for you know, investigating characteristics of the implementation. I, I will take a look first, though, at you know, what are these numbers. Um, I have a, a graph here. I'm not sure if these numbers are, are terribly visible to you all. Um, the green bars uh, correspond to this baseline JIT, which doesn't do any uh, global analysis. And the yellow bars correspond to the DFG JIT, which is the optimizing compiler. And you can see on, you know, we get three and four times improvements, uh, except on the regular expression one, which I'll you know, talk a little bit later. About. Now, I want to also use this graph to introduce a, an idea I'm trying to work on in this presentation. It's probably not you know, finished and can be much better. But it's that you know, performance is not simply a number. It, it is a distribution uh, that you can sample. You need to take a number of, of samples and see you know, what is the range of performance that I expect. And so at the top of all these bars, I've got uh, little histograms superimposed. I don't know if I'm doing this quite right anyway, but uh, you can see like. Uh, for example, on, on this DFG JIT uh, histogram, we see that they're all very tightly clustered. Uh, whereas on this other DFG JIT histogram, we have a, a bimodal distribution. They're, they're pretty tight, you know, but their your performance tends to cluster those two values. And that's something that you really can't capture with a median. And I'm going to use this sort of thing uh, as we go forward to, to really pull apart some of these uh, benchmarks. And really, 
I'm not going to use the straight V8 benchmarks to, uh, as my tool. I'm going to hack them a bit to, to see what, what are the dynamic characteristics of the DFG. I'm going to make the warm-up time variable, starting from no warm-up at all, all the way up to a second, with uh, more samples closer to, to zero, so after zero milliseconds, after five milliseconds, after 10 milliseconds, meaning after 10 milliseconds, you know, what's the performance I can expect on my web page with JavaScript core? After 25 milliseconds, what's, what's the kind of performance I can expect? And then the thing I measure after the warm-up is going to be five milliseconds of, uh, of runtime. And it, it, it's a good measure of, of the code that the DFG can produce, but it's, uh, it's a very tricky measurement as well because it's sensitive. Let's say in those five milliseconds, milliseconds where I'm measuring, you know, what if GC hits? Well, you know, I, it, I'm going to get much worse results for that particular run, uh, for example. Or what if uh, the optimizer decides to optimize a lot of code in that five millisecond um, window? Well, you know, also I can, I can experience some slowdowns. Oh, and as well, we have some issues with timer precision uh, in JavaScript for, memory, uh, for measuring these things. I'm using the more precise timer that's available in the JSC runtime called precise time, uh, which gives me a bit more precision in this regard. But all of these things, you know, the, these unexpected pauses, these you know, sources of variation in performance can also affect your real code. So I think it's, it's not unfair to actually be measuring these things. So, in this experiment, more than other ones, we really need to take a look at, th at this shape of performance again and see you know, what's going on. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the first uh, V8 benchmark, which is the Richards benchmark. Um, it's a scheduler, and it uses uh, some bit operations for maintaining the states of tasks in the scheduler. And it uh, uses a bunch of objects with properties and prototype resolution and such. And what we can see here is that, you know, here at zero milliseconds, we're starting off with pretty poor performance, which is natural. You don't want to spend your time optimizing code that you don't know is going to run. Um, but after you know, five milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, certainly uh, after 75 milliseconds, we're up to our peak performance. These vertical lines uh, indicate runs of the optimizing compiler. So you can see that they're all clustered before 75. Uh, you probably can't even read that. Let's go to 0, 5, 10, 15, 25, 40, 75. 120, 200, 320, 500, 700, 1,000 milliseconds, right? So from zero to one second. This is your, the dynamic uh, profile of the DFG performance. And what we see graphed here uh, is the distribution of performance results that I've taken. So for, I've, for example, warmed up V8 for zero milliseconds and then measured the next five milliseconds 50 times, right? And those 50 values are plotted here. Same for five milliseconds, same for 10, I don't know. I, I try to make it understandable, but uh, it's, a, it's a novel graph kind, and that, that never goes over quite so well. What we see, though, is uh, performance is fairly tightly clustered. Uh, the paint, if there's more paint, it means that there's uh, a higher uh, variance in, in the performance. And here we see things are fairly tight. It goes up, drops down a bit for some reason I don't quite understand. Uh, but then no optimizing compiler run happens after 75 milliseconds. So. 75 milliseconds in this benchmark, and, and the DFG's done all that it sees fit to do. And uh, so we get a 3.7 times performance increase. Uh, 1.0 would be no, no increase at all uh, on this particular benchmark relative to the baseline JIT measured over a full second. Um, and now we get into hardcore stuff. Uh, one of the things that turned out, we'll just take an example of one of the functions that, um, that we went to optimize here. I don't know, how, how many of you have looked at the source code for the V8 benchmarks? A few of y'all? The engine hackers, I, I see. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> for the rest of y'all, uh, here's the JavaScript up here. Uh, we add something to a, a task saying, you know, is this suspended? Uh, we do a bit and uh, compare, and we have another clause that they're logical or together, and we return it. And the assembly that's below is what, what you can see on the screen right now corresponds to this this dot state uh, bitwise and with state held. Uh, first, we get this, which is a local variable, and that's just a, a memory reference. We check that the this has the prototype that we saw when it was initially compiled, when it was optimized. And if it does not have this prototype, we're going to jump to this bailout, where, at which point we de-optimize which uh, might be a word you've heard from other discussions of 
optimizing compilers like Crankshaft, for example. Um, then we, once we verify that, the, that the, this object has the shape that we're expecting, uh, we directly re uh, reference a field in the object using you know, what, what the V8 folks call hidden classes. Um, we get the global variable corresponding to state held. It's unfortunate that we didn't inline this to a constant, but OK. Uh, and then we go ahead and, and do the bitwise AND. The first uh, four instructions correspond to type checks that the this.state and the state held are both uh, integers. R14, this is a 64-bit assembly code, and R14 holds the, the number tag. So we compare the number tag on the, on the value. Uh, JavaScript core uses the NAN boxing technique. NAN boxing, uh, folks heard of it? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, you guys are great. If you haven't heard of it, you know, search NAN boxing on the web. Also search for NUN boxing. And I don't think there's you know, any pugilistic encounters, but uh, I don't know. Uh, finally, after this, we have uh, uh, some comparisons. We compare the, the value to zero. Uh, we invert it. We actually store it to memory. That's the set local. And then we do a branch. And, and this is suboptimal, to be honest. Like all, many of these things could be joined together, but you know, this, this, these are the instructions that are produced for that you know, very first uh, part uh, of this function. There are some more, and finally we return. And then after the end of the main path, all the bailouts, all the points where we you know, jump to if, if something wasn't expected. I got to check myself, because I could talk about this forever. That's just the first benchmark. So uh, second is Delta Blue. It's a constraint solver. Uh, and we get a, a, a fine speed up on this one. We get a bit more, more paint here, as you can see. There's more yellow. There's more uh, variance towards there. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But on this one, it's very, it's very important to inline. Uh, but we see some, if I look at the logs, and I'll, I'll talk about how to get the logs a little bit later, I think. Yeah. Uh, we, we see some entries like delaying optimization for this thing. And it's called in a loop because we have insufficient profiling. And so this indicates that you know, for this optimizing compiler, as with all uh, JavaScript optimizing compilers, we need what they call profiling, which is uh, the, the runtime type feedback, the type information. And there's actually a, um, an option to tweak how much it, it waits or doesn't wait uh, for some profiling information. And in this case, it hits the maximum of uh, five attempts to profile. So it, it starts first at a, after 20 milliseconds, and, and then eventually, after trying again four more times, at, at 40 milliseconds in, it, it go, goes ahead and, and creates the optimized code. It's like it would like more information, so it's going to wait for it. It waits. It doesn't find it, so it, uh, it produces the code. And that's the, the general flavor of things. This is, I, I looked through the logs uh, for you know, what kinds of functions were actually uh, compiled in this early phase. And if I go back to the graph, sorry for switching back and forth, we see that you know, it's really between 15 and 25 and 40 milliseconds is where we start to jump up to our, our, our level. And that's, that's generally you know, the time range that your optimizing compiler will kick in. And I saw this is one of the functions. It doesn't look very hot to me. I mean, I, I haven't actually run the dynamic profiler and, and, and seen if this is hot. But you know, just looking at the code, it, it didn't look like it was going to be something that was particularly hot. And what that, what that indicates to me is that um, here we just have a lot of work to do. And indeed, if we go back, I apologize again, going back, we see a lot more vertical lines in this one compared to Richard's. And they go a lot later. You know, They go after 75. It seems they go, there's some all, all the way up at 1,000. And I'm sure if it ran for more, uh, more would run. So some code, especially code with small functions that needs a bunch of inlining and such, um, it's going to take some more work to be optimized. Richard's, the, the previous example, it was a bit simpler for the DFG to work with. The next one is uh, crypto. Uh, crypto is kind of interesting. It uh, deals a lot with integers, and it deals a lot with uh, arrays as well. Um, again, we see a lot of lines. Um, the, there, you can see some notable clustering as well. Uh, clustering is like when a line is bigger. That's because two lines are drawn really close together. Uh, the DFG uh, optimizer will kick in based on a profile count. So for example, a loop executes uh, a thousand times or something. Um, and, and that can lead to clustering, because th there are a lot of loops and functions whose uh, execution counts are linked. You know, If you call this function a thousand times, then this loop will run 5,000 times, and this other function will run a thousand times. So they can all kick in at, the, at about the same time. So you can, you can get this sort of uh, clustering effect. It usually doesn't affect performance, I, I don't think. 
may, maybe it can cause an optimization, optimization slowdown, but uh, I don't know. It's an interesting characteristic. But I like this one because uh, crypto is a great benchmark to optimize because there's lots of, you know, classical compiler optimizations that you know us compiler nerds really, really dig on. And this is uh, one of the functions that's in the benchmark, as we can see. Uh, you know, we have a lot of integer operations uh, trying to keep in the range of integers that are efficient in JavaScript. Um, and if I take a look at one of the particular lines, which is uh, fetching a value from an array and then doing a bitwise and with a constant, uh, we can see that we get the array, uh, which, is, which is this array. We, we fetch that out from memory. Uh, we get I, which uh, for some reason is in memory as well. I, I don't think it's actually a good idea for it to be in memory, but okay. Um, and we get this, this is actually a relatively new thing, just landed about a month ago, this butterfly uh, representation. This is a way uh, in the future to store out of line uh, data, like um, the elements in an array, to potentially store them as unboxed values. It's not completely taken advantage of yet, and I think it's one of the things that in JavaScript core, in the DFG, we'll, we'll start to see in the next uh, couple months or so. Uh, but this is a pointer to either a, a small amount of inline data. So if your array only has two elements, for example, they're probably going to be allocated in the same block as your, as your object, or a, a pointer to out of line data uh, containing the rest of the array. The get by val uh, checks that the uh, integer is in bounds uh, up for the array. Uh, and if not, it bails out. Uh, fetches the value and checks if the value is a whole, and if not, it bails out. And then finally, we do uh, a bitwise and. Another thing that I wasn't mentioning before is that between these operations, these operations are, are the part of the internal representation of the DFG compiler. So they don't, they correspond loosely to things that you need to do semantically uh, in JavaScript, but they don't correspond exactly to bytecode, and they don't correspond exactly to the, the specification either. Uh, but what we see is that uh, for example, we have uh, we get this array and we put it in R10, and then uh, down here we use R10, and, and then later on we can use uh, we can use these values directly in those registers. Register allocation is you know, obviously a huge optimization that uh, all of the optimizing compilers do, and so even if you don't have a lot of type information, you know, running the optimizing compiler on a piece of code can still be uh, quite advantageous. Right. So, ray trace. Here we uh, have an interesting example. It's the first floating point example in the V8 test suites. It uses some floating point math, and it uses objects with floating point fields, so like this.x being a floating point number. Uh, we see very tight performance here, and then we, uh, as we uh, warm up a bit more, we start to see a, a bit more variance. And whenever you see variance in a, a very small benchmark like this, it means that something is slowing down the benchmark uh, sometimes, but not some other times. So, any guesses as to what this could be in this particular case? Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, the reason we have so much variance, and, and you probably can't see this right now, but it goes from here all the way to here. There's a histogram line drawn there. Is because sometimes we hit garbage collection and sometimes we don't. In the ray trace example, we get a lot of uh, short-lived objects with uh, floating point fields. So you can you can get very good performance uh, as long as you don't hit GC, and if you do hit GC, you get uh, uh, less performance. And I'll talk about that a bit more when we get to the more uh, strong tests of the garbage collector later. As one example of code that the DFG works with uh, for this one, we have this normalize function, and it takes a vector, and it returns a new vector, and it normali uh, normalized. As it compiles this function, uh, when the DFG gets to this dot magnitude, it's going to inline. Uh, the code for this magnitude, which is pretty awesome optimization, I, also done by other uh, other systems, but you know it's it's pretty key to do. And I I just want to focus a bit on 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 what happens when we store the result for uh, this dot x divided by m. Uh, we ended up dividing by things that are placed in SSE registers, so it's just one instruction after we've uh, loaded up the values. But then when we go to store it, uh, we re-add a number tag on the value uh, in the high bits of the value, or I think it rotates the value around, actually. And, um, and we store it as a sort of general JavaScript object, which only occupies one word, but uh, in, 
into this object, which means that we don't have fields that are unboxed values in JavaScript core. We don't have uh, this.x can be like an int32, for example, or this.x can be a, a float, and we always know it's a float. Otherwise, we, you know, we would leave off this tagging step. Early Boyer. Uh, again, we see a lot of paint because we see a lot of short-term allocations. Uh, these are two benchmarks that were translated from Scheme, actually, by uh, an automatic translator, by the same fellow that does the Dart to JavaScript translator, incidentally. And um, so what we see are a lot of uh, calls to small functions and a lot of allocation uh, of short-lived objects. So this is something that a, a generational collector, collector will do really awesome on. Uh, but in JavaScript Core's case, uh, when the garbage collector needs to run, it actually stops everything. And then it, it, it scans the entire space in parallel. I mean, you have maybe eight cores in your system or four cores, and it will use all of them. Uh, but it, it does have to scan the whole space to see what's live and what's dead, and then it lets the program go on. And that leads to this, uh, you know, these huge variances here, 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 and, and, and ongoing. I think uh, the outside color corresponds to 90% of the samples, and that uh, red in the middle is the, the middle 10%. Uh, you can think of the, the reddest red as a kind of median line on these. Um, so it, it's just an indication of this, this thing. I, I, you know, if, if you take nothing else <laughs> from this presentation is that you know, numbers are really awesome when you're having, you know, shootouts and races and marketing and things like that. Uh, but if you actually want to understand, you know, anything about your own performance, uh, then you need to treat performance as a, as a distribution of values and, and not simply a number. Um, next, we've got the regular expression benchmark, and there's not really anything to say here because the regular expressions have their own compiler in, in all the engines, and it's not really subject to the optimizing compiler. And so the DFG doesn't really do anything for us here. And that's, that's basically that. It, it seems to run, but very few times, maybe uh, 15 times or so, uh, giving us a, you know, a speed up in the loops around which the regular expressions run, but, but not in the regular expressions themselves, with, which take the bulk of the time. Finally, we're, we're getting to the end here, I think. Good. Uh, we have the splay benchmark, which tests uh, allocations that are very long-lived. So it's terrible for generational collectors. JavaScript Core actually does fairly well in this. Uh, but what you can see, uh, again, is, is the huge amount of variance here. We, we go from you know, all the way on the bottom here, when we have to stop the world and you know, mark an enormous heap, to you know, something that's quite good up there. And, and you don't see the, this kind of variance if you just look at the numbers in the end. Like If you just look at the, the raw performance numbers, measured over a second, because if you measure a second, you're amortizing all these uh, garbage collection costs. You're not measuring you know, what is your maximum pause time, for example. So in this case, uh, we're seeing a pretty poor uh, maximum pause time uh, because of this stop the world, although it's parallel, you know, but stop the world marker. And finally, uh, we have the newest addition to the V8 benchmarks, I guess if they're still around, and we don't all move to octane benchmarks or such. Uh, which is a Navier-Stokes benchmark. It has a, array, a large array of floating point numbers, but not using the typed arrays. So what this really measures is, uh, OK, first of all, are you doing good floating point wise? Does your optimizing compiler deal with floating point well? And can you automatically turn arrays of floating point values into arrays of unboxed floats? Uh, you know, and uh, in the case of V8, they can do this. In the case of JavaScript Core, you know, we can't. So uh, for example, this get by val uh, fetches a value you know, at the index with the same uh, range check and is it a whole, a and uh, we get we get some local value I think, uh, and then we uh, turn this value we got into a double, we, which actually doesn't take very much code, but it's it's more than uh, if it was an unboxed array and we knew it was a double already. Um, so yeah, no no automatic turning of arrays into double arrays. Finally, before I close, I'd like to you know, mention how I got this data. Uh, if you run JSC, and I think um, you know, there's so many Apple laptops around here, <laughs> you probably have JavaScript Core installed if you can locate the JSC program. Uh, if you run it with dash dash options, it gives you a spit out of uh, knobs you can turn. Uh, the dash D will dump uh, bytecode, which is useful uh, in 
uh, together with the op uh, together with uh, disassembly if you say show dfg disassembly but in order to get the timestamps uh, the information that i showed you you have to enable some ver verbose logging and the the graphs that i showed you I, I measured them without the verbose logging and then i superimposed uh, the dfg vertical bars after enabling verbose logging so they were from separate runs and not entirely identical so you know don't try to correlate those uh, too precisely. Um, right, so back to the hubris, I guess, you know, JavaScript core is fast as V8 on its own benchmark and stuff. And, and yeah, it is, and it's faster, and it's slower also. <laughs> because, uh, you know, we got a bunch of different tests, like we're doing real great on Richards. I say, you know, we as a JavaScript core hacker, I, I don't actually have a dog in this race, but, you know, do great on Richards, not so great on Delta Blue, the same on Crypto, uh, really eating it on Early Boyer. Uh, but we're, you know, picking up on Splay. And, and it's just, you know, a classic example of, you know, boy, JavaScript core is, you know, really killing it on Splay, right? But the pause time, it's, it's not on this graph, right? You can't see it because those costs are amortized over the entire second of collection. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, JavaScript core is optimizing compiler. Uh, I'll take uh, some questions now. Sure. First of all, awesome talk. Love it. Um, Thank you. Being a uh, you know a VM geek, obviously I do. Um, the question I have is for the butterfly. Um, forget what that was. Uh, not view, but something else. Um, is that intended to be for arrays only? Or do, is there a plan for making unboxed values for objects as well for property? I think it's for both. Uh, I haven't talked with uh, the fellow that implemented, but it, as far as I understand, it's for both. Sounds very cool. Hi. Um, are there plans to expose this information for developers? Like, uh, when are uh, you know certain parts of the code hot? Uh, when is your program actually doing something bad that's throwing off the uh, the JIT and whatever? Um, because that, that's that's actually something that that we're missing right now. That that kind of information. That's a good question. I think the the general answer to that is the profiler, and the profiler I believe is hooked up to uh, the inspector. And if it's not, the, then that's a problem. I mean. That doesn't really tell you that it's actually throwing it off. I mean, it, it just you see a, a decrease in performance, but it doesn't really tell you, you know, which part of the code is is causing it, or you know, why your 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 JIT is failing, basically. So, uh, so is there? I don't know. Like maybe like a a, a heat map. That instance? would be awesome. It's not implemented yet. Okay. So JavaScript Core has three different compilers. Uh, that seems like a fairly high number. Uh, do they really need that many? I don't think so. Uh, I believe the plan is, well, the, the plan is driven by results, right? So does it slow down something or not? Um, and I think the low-level interpreter has seemed to work for just munching a lot of code that doesn't run very often. Uh, and the DFG works for hot code. And, and I think the question is, is this baseline JIT necessary? And it seems that right now to remove it is not worth, um, it, it, it's still in a, a performance improvement. But I think that's probably due to inefficiencies or things that aren't complete in the, in the optimizing compiler more than any fundamental architectural advantage. But I'm kind of talking out my ass, so. Um, just to j double check, as I understand, the uh, the JIT compiler runs in threads, so you have to stop the world in order to compile. So, like the uh, the the bunching of compilation could cause pauses in an, in and of itself as well. Yeah. Okay, I guess that's it. Um, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you.